In this video, we're going to continue the topic, how does a speed camera work? We're going to be considering waves. In order to understand how a speed camera works, we first need to understand waves, how they move and what they are. So waves are disturbances that carry energy, but not matter. So I want you to have a picture in your head, not of waves breaking on the beach, but deep out to sea where the waves are rhythmically going up and down, up and down, up and down. That's the picture you need to have. Now there's a couple of different ways to classify waves. We can classify waves as mechanical waves. Mechanical waves are those that need a medium to travel through. So sound waves are an example of a mechanical wave. Let's have a look at this clip from PhysClips now, showing what happens when we move, remove the medium that sound waves need to travel through. Sound waves need air to travel through. Travels from the source to our ears, passing through air on the way. Let's pump the air out of the jar. sound level is much reduced. Some vibration is conducted through the floor of the jar, but there's no air to conduct sound. Until we let the air back in. So this means that all those space movies, such as Star Wars, where the spaceship explodes and then there's this massive bang, are all wrong. In space, there's no air, it's a vacuum, and so sound doesn't actually travel. Other examples of mechanical waves include water waves, waves sent along a string or a spring, and waves generated in an earthquake. Now the other type of wave is an electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic waves are waves like light waves, radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays. These waves all travel through space at the speed of light and do not require a medium to travel through. They only travel in a vacuum in the speed of light. When they enter another medium, they actually slow down, as we'll see in the next topic. So this image shows you the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Speed cameras have a wa use a wavelength of about three centimeters, so this falls just into the radio wavelength. So waves are periodic disturbances. This means that the pattern of a wave repeats itself. So now let's look at another way to classify waves. Waves can be classified as transverse or longitudinal. A in a transverse wave, the particles which make up the medium move in a direction which is perpendicular to the direction the wave travels. So let's have a look at this example from PhysClips showing a transverse wave moving along a slinky coil. So here you see the actual particles making up the slinky move up and down while the wave travels from the left to the right. So examples of transverse wave include waves on a string or electromagnetic waves. In electromagnetic waves, it's actually the electric and magnetic fields oscillating in a direction perpendicular to the direction the wave is traveling. The other type of wave is a longitudinal wave. In a longitudinal wave, the velocity of the wave is parallel to the direction that the particles that make up the medium vibrate. So examples of longitudinal waves include sound waves and compressions sent along a slinky coil. So let's now have a look at this example of a longitudinal wave, again taken from the PhysClip site. So in this clip you can see that with the longitudinal wave, the particles making up the slinky move in a direction parallel to the direction that the wave travels. Now there's several terms associated with waves that you're going to need to know. 
first of these is wavelength. The wavelength, like its name implies, is the length of the wave. It's given the symbol lambda and is measured in metres. So one way to measure the wavelength is to measure from the crest of one wave to the crest, to the next crest on the wave, and that difference in distance is called the wavelength. Alternatively, you could measure from the trough to the trough. The amplitude of the wave is half of the height between the crest and the trough. So the amplitude is actually the maximum distance that the particles can be from their equilibrium position. So amplitude is generally given the symbol capital A and is also measured in metres. The period of a wave is given the symbol capital T. To measure the period of the wave, you'd measure, if you started your stopwatch when one crest passed you and then waited until the next crest passed you, you would have measured one period. So the period is how long it takes for one wavelength to move past you. The period is measured in seconds. The frequency of the wave is the inverse of the period. So it's how often these crests pass you. The units for the frequency are hertz or inverse second. So frequency is given the symbol F and the frequency is equal to 1 over T. So let's do an example now. So the question is, a wave travelling in the positive x direction is pictured below. Calculate the period, frequency, amplitude and wavelength if you measure that it takes two seconds from when one crest passes you until the next crest passes you. And here's the diagram showing the wave. Okay, so we know that the period is equal to two seconds as it takes two seconds from when one crest passes you to when the next crest passes you. So the frequency is equal to one over the period. So that's one over two, which is equal to 0 0.50 hertz. The wavelength is equal to the distance between the two crests, so that's 40 centimetres, which is 0 0.40 metres. And the amplitude is the displacement from equilibrium, so that's this 20 centimetres. So the amplitude's 20 centimetres, which is 0 0.20 metres. Now one important thing about a wave is its speed. The speed of a wave is just given by the frequency times the wavelength. Now this isn't too hard to derive as we know that speed is equal to distance over time. So the distance that a wave has to travel to be back to where it started from is one wavelength and the time it takes to do so is one period. So we have that the speed is equal to one wavelength divided by one period. Now the inverse of a period is just the frequency. So this leads us to V is equal to F lambda. The velocity of the wave is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. Let's do an example now where we'll work out the speed of a wave. So the question is, given the same wave as before with a period of two seconds, calculate the wave speed. So in order to calculate this, we'll need to use V is equal to F lambda. So we know that frequency is equal to the inverse of the period. So this is the wavelength over the period. The wavelength is the 40 centimetres, so 0 0.40 metres. And this is divided by 2.0. So we get 0 0.20 metres per second, or 20 centimetres per second. Now we're going to consider what happens when the wave moves along a medium and comes to a boundary. At this point, two things can happen. The wave can be reflected or it can be transmitted. Now if the wave comes to a fixed boundary, it's reflected, but it actually undergoes a phase change. 
So if we had a pulse traveling along a string, it got to this boundary and it was reflected, it would be reflected back underneath the string. If the wave is traveling along and comes to a boundary which is free to move, so for example, a loop on a rod, in that case, when it gets reflected from this boundary, it doesn't undergo a phase change. If the pulse was traveling along the string on top of the string and it was reflected, it would travel back also on top of the string. So let's have a look at a demonstration of that now, taken from Fizz Clips. At boundaries, there are usually reflections. This string is tied to an object so massive that its acceleration is negligible. As the pulse reaches the boundary, the force exerted on the string by the fixed end accelerates the peak downward. The resultant momentum takes it past equilibrium into negative displacement. So at an immovable boundary, we say the wave is reflected with a phase change of pi. The animation shows the original pulse traveling right plus an inverted pulse traveling left. In a linear medium, we can simply add them to give the observed reflection. In this apparatus, torsional waves travel in one dimension. The displacement here is the angular displacement of these bars, and the restoring effect comes from the torsional stiffness of this steel strip. The inertia is the rotational inertia of the bars. With a fixed boundary, we again see reflection with a phase change of pi. Now we remove the clamps. The boundary is completely free. What happens at reflection this time? Here, there is no restoring effect of the free boundary, so the displacement there is greater. The upwards momentum of the pulse is now transferred to the trailing edge, which in turn sends a pulse back from the boundary with a phase change of zero. The pattern we observe is the sum of the original wave plus a reflected wave with the same sign. If the boundary is neither fixed nor completely free, we see transmission at the interface as well as reflection. Here, the string and the rope have different line densities mu, but when connected, share the same tension. Going from low density to high, we see that the wave reflected at the join has a phase change of pi. So does the reflection from the fixed end. As a result, both reflections return on the left side. Going from high density to low, the wave reflected at the junction has a phase change of zero, so it returns on the right side. The reflection from the fixed end still has a phase change of pi, so the two reflections return on opposite sides. In both cases, note that the transmitted wave has no phase change. Now, if a wave comes to a boundary, some of it may be transmitted. If it's transmitted, then it just continues going like it was before. However, the speed of the wave in that new medium may be a bit different to how it was in the first medium. If waves move to a more dense medium, a kind of heavier medium, then they start travelling slower and their wavelength actually gets a bit shorter as well. If a wave goes to a less dense medium, so like it's traveling from a really fat rope and it goes into a really skinny rope, it then starts to travel faster. So often you get a combination of reflection and transmission at a boundary. So with that in mind, watch this again. See how on the left hand side, when it travels to the more dense medium, the wave slows down and the wavelength actually decreases. On the right hand side, when it travels to a less dense medium, the wave actually speeds up and the wavelength gets a little bit longer. So we've seen that as a wave moves from one medium to another, its velocity will change. If it goes to a more dense medium, it will slow down. And because of our equation v is equal to f lambda, when it moves from one medium to another, the frequency doesn't actually change. So if the velocity decreases, lambda, the wavelength, also has to decrease. So this is why waves get more compressed when they move into a more dense medium. If it moves into a less dense medium, 
then it travels faster and the wavelength spreads out. So how do we apply this all to speed cameras? Well, speed cameras use a radar system. Radar stands for radio detecting and ranging. So it uses radio wavelengths to send out a signal which is reflected off your car and it then detects this signal and measures the frequency that it records. It can use that frequency to calculate your speed. So in the next video, we're going to be looking at the relationship between the frequency of a reflected wave and the speed of the object of which is reflecting that wave. So this is known as the Doppler effect. So a special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming this video. Thanks to these people for providing the electromagnetic spectrum picture with a Creative Commons license. And special thanks to Joe Wolf for producing Fizz Clips, which we made use of in this video.